Hello everyone. Hope you're having a great Veterans Day. I'm Martin McHugh and I'll be your moderator today. I'd like to welcome you to Mox's webinar, uh, Best Practices for Ethernet IP Networks. If you have any questions at any time during the webinar, please use the questions pane by simply typing in your question and clicking send. At the end of the presentation, we'll do a Q&A session and take as many questions as we have time for. We will follow up with any unanswered questions after the webinar. Okay, let's get started. We will have a 30 to 40 minute presentation with 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A. Today's presenter is Paul Wacker. Paul is the Product Marketing Manager for the Industrial Device Connectivity Group here at MOXA. And with that, I'll hand it over to Paul. Hey, thanks, Martin, um, and thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Um, uh, we've got a really interesting topic and uh, um, actually a, a pretty expansive one uh, as we were kind of compiling this and bringing together some of the things we've learned about Ethernet IP and some of the best practices we found. Um, I, I realized, you know, how big of a topic is and, and how uh, difficult it is to kind of do as much as you'd like to do. So uh, hopefully all of you will be able to kind of learn something new uh, to apply to what you do. And uh, for, for those of you that are looking for more, um, towards the end of the session, uh, I have some great references to, for you for some uh, third-party sites uh, to, to do more in-depth study of that. Uh, with that, let's go ahead and get started here. We're going to do a pretty high-level uh, review of some of the some of the basics of uh, Ethernet IP here. You know, we're going to do a little poll in just a moment here to get a little feeling, you know, a little feedback from you folks in the audience as to who we have today, so we can tailor the presentation to you a little better. Um, talk about some things about you know, um, not so much about the end devices, but really a lot about the infrastructure uh, as to what you're designing and what you're doing and talk about things such as uh, uh, requirements uh, for that, talk about you know, designing for high availability. And something that doesn't get as much attention as it should is um, not just designing a system and forgetting about it, but thinking about this as something that is going to uh, perhaps uh, change over time and develop further as you may add on to a system uh, about monitoring your infrastructure. And then finally, to, look, to end up as at the end, you know, it's not always that you can have a totally um, uh, one solution fits everything. And I think in the last several years, it's been interesting to see how there's been an emergence uh, with open standards and with sharing of best practices of more of a um, um, best of breed solution, if you will. And we'll talk a little about you know, what happens when you have non-Ethernet IP devices that you need to bring into the whole solution. Um, with that, uh, Martin, I'd like to go ahead and open up and do, uh, do a poll here. And let's get a little feel, feel from the on stay as to their level of experience um, with Ethernet IP. And again, we usually expect pretty diverse crowds with this. Um, you know, if you could let us know a little bit about your experience, you know, whether this is your first time and you're here to learn more about it. Um, or whether you know maybe you have a little bit of experience doing it. Um, uh, generally, we find you know different disciplines here, from folks that are uh, maintaining equipment you know at a, at a plant or factory, um, to those folks that are involved in systems integration. So sometimes some of you folks may be uh, OEMs integrating this into your technology. Um, also, if you maybe have some experience already working with that with standalone systems. Um, and maybe you're, you know, designing new systems uh, from an OEM perspective. So with that, um, great. And I have Martin showing the results here. So it looks like I expected, you know, a mixed crowd with a lot of people with limited experience. So that'll be great um, since there's a lot here that uh, is relevant to, to what you're doing. So let's take a little look at that. Since a lot of you folks have a limited experience with it, um, I think this is a great place to start just taking, by taking a little look at where we've come from. And, um, uh, you know, in this world of industrial automation, we've had just dozens and dozens of different types of protocols. Um, what we're looking at here is just a little bit dated, but it gives you kind of a little bit of, of a look back as to where we've come from. You know, Ethernet's still relatively new in the world of industrial automation with lots of fragmentation in the past past of you know, different manufacturers promoting their own standards. So in the past we had field bus systems like Siemens with Profi bus and you know, DeviceNet from Rockwell and you know, everybody else doing perhaps Modbus and some of these definite purposes types of, uh, types of network uh, installations. We've 
seen this mass migration to move up into this upper right hand quadrant uh, utilizing um, you know Ethernet for this and let me turn on my little spotlight here and you can see the move we've made to Ethernet let's break that down a little bit and look at that specifically for um, uh, for the specific applications it goes into and this has actually grown a little bit these are installations as of 2010 and I want to emphasize this is worldwide so for us here in the you know the US and North America um, the numbers are skewed a little bit on a worldwide level, you see it's split evenly um, up to, amongst Profinet, which is the Siemens solution, uh, which is actually a good solution for Ethernet and uh, uh, networking of act automation devices, with Ethernet IP playing uh, playing a, a quarter of that pie, if you will, a little over a quarter, almost a third, and then Modbus TCP uh, playing within this whole Ethernet space here, with a couple others um, that are really specialty that I my perspective is for motion applications and some certain segments where you're bringing in motion into um, a, a Ethernet based uh, controls architecture. What I think is not missing from here is if you look just from the US standpoint, the segment of Ethernet IP is, is a much larger uh, portion of this pie and growing um, and uh, actually growing on a worldwide basis. So I give you a little perspective of where we've been and where we're going to with really this move to Ethernet being just a really great solution to integrate all of your automation devices, whether they're PLCs, whether they're the operator interface, whether it's SCADA, or even other specialty purpose devices on that network. Now, for those of you that have uh, limited experience, you know, a number of you that have in, in mentioned that this is kind of your first entrance into it, you know, remember um, a little bit about where this came from. Some of you may remember um, uh, some of this uh, from efforts done by Alan Bradley and Rockwell that basically developed the standard you know back in the uh, back in the 90s and one of the neat things that uh, they, they had done is to approach this not from a vendor specific orientation but actually uh, forming an organization that actually started with some of you may recall DeviceNet as a precursor that kind of led up to what we're doing now with Ethernet IP um, called ODVA and um, this organization did a great job, and some of you that know the other standards like uh, Prof Profibus and Propinet, there's an organization called PI that's doing the same thing. But basically um, setting up an organization to promote the technology, to do education, to do outreach, to help folks like you understand how to take this technology and apply it for your application to solve your problems in your plant, your factory, or in the equipment that you build, and to help with that educational piece and also to help with uh, promoting these technologies with multiple vendors so it's not just a single point solution but coming from a lot of different places. Now one of the things I think that um, Rockwell and Alan Bradley did that, that was really exciting is, is not to come out with something new that replaces everything else but to build on some existing strong foundations. So taking uh, the best of solutions with ControlNet and with DeviceNet that has something called uh, CIP or Common Industrial Protocol and this was the foundation that actually was used to to build up Ethernet IP so that it was easy to migrate and easy to use a lot of existing technologies in place for them. And um, you'll even see that some of the, and we'll go into a little bit of this and how this is important for your infrastructure in looking at the methodology they use of something called producer-consumer type messaging um, which is not often used on Ethernet and is very important for a performance standpoint for that. Um, the other part of this that I think is something you've seen develop um, you know, just across the board and being able to embrace uh, Ethernet technology in automation applications and also um, utilizing you know, common protocols like Internet protocol to do this. Um, so basically utilizing existing standards for Ethernet IP has been very important to make it easy for folks like you to um, utilize this in your plants, your factories, you know, in projects you're working on and so forth. Um, and you know, if you kind of look at where we're at today, you know, Ethernet IP has become overwhelmingly the uh, most popular standard for, uh, for North America and actually growing on a worldwide perspective and um, also embraced by a lot of different vendors. So even if you're not, you know, a, a plant that's used utilizing Rockwell, um, you know you can go to um, vendors doing um, 
uh, pneumatic control to vendors, perhaps with a, a variable speed drive that has some level of support for this, as well as a whole ecosystems of multiple vendors to do this, um, in addition to the stuff that's been done by Rockwell and, um, and Alan Bradley. So a lot here on that. Um, one of the things that I wanted just to introduce a little bit of some of the, the layering of this. Um, this is, gets to be a little bit technical, and if you'd like to know more um, in the presentation, which I believe Martin will make available to you if you want to download these after today's session, um, you'll be able to dig, dig into this more. Um, there's some really great resources, and I'll talk more about this even towards the end of our session today. Um, uh, the ODVA organization um, has a lot of these great documents that have been built up by multi-vendor uh, efforts to do this, and you'll be able to see more of this um, in some of those documents. But I think the key thing here is all of these new standards that have been developed in the last five and ten years really come out of embracing open standards. So when we talk about Ethernet IP, one of the huge strengths to it is it's able to utilize standard Ethernet. It's able to utilize the standard IP protocols, so using TCP IP and UDP IP, and you'll see more in a few slides of how that's important. And then layered on top of that is the common industrial protocol that came from uh, control net and device net. Um, that means that uh, a lot of existing technologies can be um, uh, supplanted with this additional technology uh, with that. So good stuff. Um, also some good resources you can get into for more insight into the specifics of it. Um, in the short amount of time we have today, we can't go into quite as much depth. Um, I'll try to point you into some places if you'd like to know more where to find out more about that. Now, um, a real important one here, I've mentioned ODVA. Um, ODVA is, is known as the Open Device Vendors Association. That's really the third party independent um, uh, body that is able to help um, uh, with resources for this. So if you're a uh, you know, uh, end user and uh, wanting to know more about this, there's some great resources here. You can kind of see a little snapshot of their website with some of the navigation sides above here. One of the uh, things I think are really important on here are the training and support uh, tools they have and also the uh, supplier directory. So um, you'll see some references to it throughout today. Um, great place to go to. Um, ODVA org is where you can find them and great places to go to find out more about these. And um, uh, some of the things that you'll find is more about the technology, more about um, uh, uh, how to apply the technology to your application, you know, more about where do I go to make sure that the solutions I'm selecting are actually uh, tested and endorsed and certified for use with Ethernet IP um, you know, as I build my systems and do my installations on it. So again, odba.org, great resource to go to um, um, for learning more about the technology learning more about uh, how to apply it with what you do. Now let's kind of move from there. Certainly, you know, in designing systems you have end devices, PLCs, perhaps uh, remote I.O., perhaps variable speed drives, perhaps operator interface and SCADA. Uh, I think most people have kind of a good idea of, of, of who those vendors are and selecting those are very unique for each one of those. Uh, we we found, have found that in talking to our customers and some of you folks that the real challenge is, is how do I tie these things together and you know what's important to doing that. So we want to spend a little time today in the short amount of time we have to talk a little bit about the infrastructure. And there's often a lot of uh, questions about that, um, uh, about, okay, I know how to select a device, I know what I need for a PLC, but how do I make sure these things work and play together here? So we're going to spend a few minutes on that and, uh, and take a look at that. And one of the best places to start at this is understanding you know, the two common modes of communication on Ethernet IP. And those two modes break up into really two broad categories that I think are important to understand. And the names are very similar and it's easy to get confused on these. The first one called implicit uh, uh, communications or implicit I.O which is generally used for high performance I.O. data transfer. Um, the best example here is in doing um, applications where you have a PLC in remote I.O. Um, so here's kind of our example here. So implicit means you know, I've got a, a device that's called a scanner like a PLC that has to talk to a remote I.O. rack. 
um, that are going to be the sensors and actuators within my system. And as a lot of you folks uh, know, that has to be time sensitive. I need to have deterministic operation so that when I turn an output on, it's going to turn on with a specified amount of time. And uh, this type of technology has some interesting um, aspects to it that you have a one-to-many association ship with that. And um, there's some interesting relationships in how these are communicated. So we're going to talk a little bit more about you know, some unique requirements within implicit uh, communications in the next few slides. The other type is called um, explicit I.O. And explicit is really for a secondary communication. And this type of communication is a little bit more of on-demand. Um, examples of this might be configuration. So I would need to download a configuration to a device. Um, or I need to do remote programming, or I need to monitor what's happening, uh, or do diagnostics. And these might be a little more analogous to program development, to SCADA, and to HMI. And these are a little different, and these types of communications are typically one-to-one, -one, um, meaning that you've got a point-to-point um, a -point or one-to-one or, -to -one or a unicast uh, type of communications happening there. Um, Unicast may be a little more IT-centric, and I'll explain those in the next slide on that. So let's take a little look at you know, some of those methoding technologies to kind of break them down a little bit into how that's important into your infrastructure, right? So when we talk about Unicast, it's having a, a one device open up a connection to another device one-to-one. -one. Um, a good example here is you know, making a telephone call. You know, if you need to pick up the phone and contact, uh, you know, one of your partner's associate or maybe a vendor, you're going to pick up the phone and dial a unique phone number and have a one-to-one -one type of, 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 of call uh, with just two parties involved on that. Um, so that's, um, that's unicast. The other type of, of uh, uh, technique is a broadcast. A good example of broadcast is today's webinar, right? So I'm your guest speaker today, and we're talking about Ethernet IP, and I'm the little red dot on the left and you folks are the green dots, um, all being able to, to, to listen to all of this and uh, be involved in the conversation. And then um, that's great, but sometimes that's not best for high performance when you have limited resources. And there's a technique called multicast, which is kind of an in-between of both of those. And this is a real important concept when it comes to networking protocols like Ethernet IP because it allows uh, special things to happen within the infrastructure to allow devices that uh, need to receive information um, that need it and to not um, have that traffic go devices that don't. Um, now, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. And there's a lot of interesting applications for this that it's not only used with industrial automation, but if some of you folks might have uh, another example of this is, is, is um, broadband service and uh, uh, TV that comes over the internet. Um, for example, um, I have UVerse at my house, and uh, that's the AT&T service to deliver TV service over IP infrastructure. Um, uh, UVerse utilizes a multicast arrangement where they can more efficiently use the IP infrastructure to deliver very high bandwidth services to the subscribers but not yet, you know, um, uh, eat up all of their infrastructure bandwidth, you know, with TV channels to everybody. Um, so we'll drill down to that. That's kind of an abstract concept. Let's go a little more into to some of this one. So um, let's take those two concepts and talk about, you know, how these are irrelevant to um, your infrastructure. And when we talk about infrastructure, that should be synonymous with Ethernet switches. And um, this is one of the areas that's probably least understood when it comes to you know, utilizing um, industrial protocols for automation applications. And there's a couple of things that are really important. Most of these are taken for granted um, within this. And the, the Ethernet IP uh, recommendations, and this comes from ODVA from a cross-vendor uh, association of this. And there's a great re resource here that's mentioned at the bottom that's basically a, a really great overview on you know, how to apply these technologies that's uh, uh, vendor agnostic and has some great best practices. And the best practices kind of fall into these. And most of these are available with any switch, you know, full duplex capabilities, LED ports that are on the switch to see what's happening, you know, making sure that you utilize a, 
um, a hardened switch for factory floor automation uh, automations and not using IT technology that was not meant to be used in extended temperature with the shock and vibration that you have. The two most difficult to understand and more important on here are uh, to, to a lesser extent port mirroring that we'll talk about a little later, but this concept called IGMP snooping. And IGMP snooping is really um, important for doing um, this implicit communications where we need to um, share information amongst devices but not overwhelm devices that don't need it. So let's kind of go into the next slide where we can talk a little bit more about that. And before we do, some of the, uh, the slides, I'm going to ask Martin to start a poll for us here. I wanted to kind of see a little bit because on that last slide we started to step into the realm of managed versus man um, unmanaged versus managed switches. And this is an area that a, a lot of times folks are involved in this. I wanted to get a little better feeling of you to here attending today, of your level of expertise um, amongst the two of those. So um, tell me a little about your understanding of you know, the key attributes of a managed switch. You know, is it that they have a secondary processor and need an IP address? Um, is it that they are only you know, really to control and prioritize network traffic? Um, uh, is it that they um, are able to provide the status of network traffic and attached devices? And um, the last one is, is, this is kind of the easy one, is it all of the above? And uh, Martin, I think we're going to go ahead and show the results there that we can share with you. That's uh, good. So the right answer was uh, the last one. It's all of the above. And I, I think this is interesting because um, uh, a lot of folks don't have the full perspective. And I'm glad to see that you folks, well, I won't spend much time here. Uh, a lot of you folks, you understand the, the difference between managed and unmanaged, that there's a lot of great things that managed switches do. And it's a recommendation by the ODVA. And there's probably a couple aspects on here that we'll be able to kind of touch up on um, through today's uh, webinar that are important to you. With that, let's kind of go back. Um, Martin, if you want to return it back to me here, and we'll move on. Um, let's talk a little bit more in detail about specifically the implications of multicast messaging. So let's take that high-level stuff we talked about, and let's drill down to maybe a little control panel here. And um, I've kind of shown some Rockwell stuff here, but you can easily see how you could have different types of devices in your application with your specific um, vendor that you like to work with. With an HMI up here and showing you know, some of the, uh, the different things like a VFD and a PLC in this one. And the key thing here is that you know, when you're going to do I.O., and in this application, I'm kind of constraining this a little bit to say, that the, uh, the PLC needs to do some type of function with the, um, the, the, the variable speed drive uh, VFD over here. And we need to set this up as I.O. So in Ethernet IP speak, we call this guy a scanner um, that's going to control access to the network. And um, the VFD over here is called an adapter uh, in Ethernet IP speak for that. And we're going to be able to map this in as I.O. to start and stop the drive to monitor fault status and maybe to change the speed of the drive. Uh, in that. Now, the important thing is what happens in the background on this. Um, you know, the first thing is, and this is where that value of the managed switch is really critical in here, by being able to utilize that IGMP snooping. Um, and uh, I know we're going to throw a lot out, and there are probably be some things I don't have enough time to get into. But if you'd like to know more about IGMP, um, there's some great tutorials um, you know, that we have at moxa.com. Um, there's also some great resources at ODBA. It's a IT technology that's actually used for that UVerse TV service I talked about on the internet, but actually was an integral, integral part of Ethernet IP to help manage the traffic a little better. Um, what happens is, is, is when you utilize a managed switch, that managed switch is able to say, hey, um, what's connected on the network? And it sends out an IGMP query to find out what's out there. And then the PLC is able to respond that, hey, uh, I, I am part of this, and I want to be uh, able to re uh, recognize the fact that you can direct traffic to just the devices that need it. So it responds with an IGMP report. And this basically opens up a two-way channel that means communication goes back and forth to these um, when you do this multicast messaging. So it's a way of saying, hey, I want to be in that group and sign me up for it, and then keep keep make sure I'm part of that traffic. So ultimately what happens in this application is is the switch is able to learn what's happening and it's able to direct traffic to just those devices that need it. So in other words, 
Um, this allows the switch to intelligently direct traffic to just the devices that need it. And if you're going to come in here, say, for example, with a, another device that needs to get on the Ethernet network, then maybe he's not using Ethernet IP. Maybe you say, for example, it's um, another device that's utilizing Modbus TCP that's got a small um, instrument that doesn't speak Ethernet IP. It means that you can have that coexist on the network and not have all of that Ethernet IP traffic coming out the switch port to that. So again, the switch being able to learn you know, what's happening and to constrain that traffic to just those devices that uh, are able to see that traffic, okay? So pretty abstract, but you know, really important task here. And we often find we get calls from customers say, hey, I just want to use an unmanaged switch in this application. And if you use unmanaged switches, they're not able to do this high level function to optimize what's happening in your network. And you can have a lot of traffic going to devices that you know, don't need to have it. So important concept. Um, if it's new to you, uh, I, I'd say this is great for you to be able to embrace this and understand that, and understand that uh, one of the great things that you know managed switches can do in these applications. Now, another part of this that's um, um, a lesser recommendation uh, and important to these from an infrastructure perspective is the aspect of virtual local area networks or VLANs. Um, interesting that again, here's again is another technology that came from the IT realm that's been in practice by IT people for you know uh, many many years, and still hasn't kind of found its way down to the industrial control panel level, except in some of the larger commercial installations that are very important to uh, limit the broadcast domain of traffic and also improve security. And I want to spend just a few moments talking about that. Um, because it can be a very useful tool for, uh, for people, um, yourself, you know, regardless of what you're doing, um, you know, building new systems as an OEM or actually supporting them in a, a factory installation um, it, with you know, how to better, better control your network. And that acts like this, and we're gonna, just going to do a quick look at this, but it means uh, being able to take a physical in infrastructure and carve that up into logical segments utilizing something called a virtual local area network. So for example, I can segment access to devices that are in one VLAN that is maybe on a specific piece of equipment like maybe the packing line here, and then segment another part that may be uh, coming from my HMI up to higher level parts of the organization that need to have SCADA access only, and then maybe have another one here that's maintenance that has access to all of this. So in other words, um, you know, think about utilizing VLANs, and if this is something that's not something you're familiar with, you know, it's a really a great place to learn more about the technology. There's some great references from ODVA, and also from um, you know your IT counterparts. Uh, I'd strongly encourage you know you to have a relationship with your IT uh, uh, folks, and uh, they've got some great tools and technologies that work really well to do this, and this gives you you know better performance in your network. Um, better levels of security that you can restrict. And this is also something with folks talking a lot now about cybersecurity. It's a way if you have do have ties into um, uh, parts above your shop floor um, to restrict their access just to the devices they need. So they, one of the key elements here is, is from that you know, MES perspective or manufacturing execution systems that you know, they can pull data out of the HMI, but they can't have access through that switch to get to the PLC. So again, probably a topic we could spend a whole hour on, um, but I just want to hit some of the highlights here to explore some things with you and you know, things maybe to look more into uh, to broaden your awareness. And again, by you know, embracing using managed switches in these applications, these are things there that maybe you're not enabled now that you can turn that feature on and get some great value of what you're perhaps already using in your application. Now to kind of tie this up a little bit, those are really the two key things from an infrastructure perspective. You know, the IGMP snooping and closely related IGMP query and also with the, uh, the VLAN. But kind of bringing it back to the ODVA, um, I wanted to make sure that you guys know that, you know, if you have any more, more questions on this, I um, really encourage you to go out. And they've got a great part of their website that you can go in and to look at the, um, the CIP supplier directly and look at, you know, 
who has uh, products that have been tested and conform with those standards. And here's just kind of a little snapshot of where to find that. You'll find a link on the bottom, but typically on the left-hand side, drill down to CIP supplier directory, uh, pick um, CIP or Ethernet IP, and you can make sure that when you're choosing products, that you choose products that have, have conformed to that. Now let's uh, move on to another topic, and we kind of got a little bog, bogged down there, but we'll pick it up here um, to keep within our time constraints today. And let's talk a little bit about that designing for high availability. And sometimes this isn't always a, a primary design goal and comes after you have a problem. Um, so it, particularly for those of you that are kind of uh, a little new to Ethernet IP, you know, think about not only getting the job done, but what happens when something doesn't go as, 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 as well behaved. And some of these things might be real simple things, and you may find this, you know, in your test lab when you're doing, um, you know, some early prototyping and development. You know, what happens if one of those cables gets unplugged? Um, do things uh, uh, shut down or behave in a predictable fa manner? Um, can you uh, allow things to happen like that? Um, if you've got systems that are larger than one panel, you know, what happens if one of those panels, you know, might have had um, a, a cable disconnected? or a power supply goes down. You know, power supplies are typically the most common failure, uh, most common devices that fail within a system. You know, what happens when you lose a power supply? Uh, what happens if, you know, maybe something inadvertently happened and a breaker trips and you lose power of the whole panel? Or, you know, myriad of other types of things to look at. And, you know, in addition to doing some real simple things, um, you know, there is things you can do to protect the power by having um, some common practices. And I think a lot of you folks probably have this experience already of you having, you know, secondary power sources, you know, maybe in critical systems utilizing. And it's really interesting to see, you know, uh, UPS technology, so uninterruptible power supplies being introduced into control panels to make sure that PLC is able to operate even if it, it loses primary power to it. But one of the areas that's maybe a little less understood is what about the Ethernet redundancy? If I lose my network connection, what do I do? So the goal here is, is to remember that, you know, in designing a, a well-architected Ethernet IP system is to think about the single, single points of failure. You know, what happens if, um, is, if a cable gets inadvertently disconnected? And those can happen in a lot of innocent, innocent ways. Um, what happens if power gets lost to a switch? You know, that switch is a connection point in a critical piece of your Ethernet IP network. Um, and, you know, from time to time you can have a switch fault. You know, um, as a vendor we do a lot of things to ensure that doesn't happen. Um, but, you know, that, that can happen. How do you make sure the rest of the network is, is, is operational? And the way we do that is, is by having um, a redundancy in your network. And that means a couple of things, that you have to have redundant paths for communication. And it also means you have to have additional um, intelligence in your network with that. And I remember when I was first learning, I, my background is a, is a former application engineer. And I think like many folks uh, made the mistake of, of using an unmanaged switch and setting up a loop where I was able to introduce traffic into a switch that recirculates. And um, it's a common thing that people do. And you can basically have uh, recirculating traffic that gets trapped in your network and bring your network to a screeching halt. Um, preventing network loops is one of the main things that switches do. And another reason you want to use managed switches. And um, that's where that additional intelligence becomes important. Managed switches will stop that from happening and block that uh, redundant traffic. So let's talk about a couple of different ways that folks do this. Here is an uh, industrial plant, and you can kind of see the conventional way, maybe from a few years back, or the conventional way of thinking. And um, here there's like one big master switch that everything feeds off of, kind of the star to topology, if you will. So that star is the single connection point, and if you lose that star, everything else dies. Um, I can understand in some applications you might have a reason to do that, um, but understand that if you have a loss of power or a problem with a switch, could it, which could even be a misconfiguration problem, or if you have uh, other problems, that everything goes black. Not, not a good design if you're looking for having some types of redundancy. And you can have redundancy by being able to um, you know, do some different types of things. And there's been a lot of studies done and there are ways you can do mesh type redundancies, but one of the things that common that commonly happens is is the infrastructure cost to support those. 
And if you look at the IT types of things of having interleaved meshes for that, that works well in a close proximity, you know, when you're connecting devices within, you know, 10, 20, 30 feet of another. But when you're talking about hundreds of feet, and thousands of feet, and maybe in larger ones, um, generally the ring type technology is a better solution for that. Uh, whereby you um, reduce your infrastructure cost to put that in place. And what I want to point, point out here is, is that in the ring technology, if I were to lose in a critical point, perhaps this node on the network here, um, and I want to make sure that I get traffic to this device over here, um, if traffic can go this, not able to go this path, traffic can come back around an alternate path. So um, one of the most cost-effective and robust networks is the ring technology and is often used for industrial applications doing this. And that means your switches have to have a way to be able to know um, which part of your network carries traffic and to block it on the other side of them. Um, to build, delve into that a little bit, let's kind of go and take a look at how that works. And there's a lot of ways you can do this, and we're not going to talk too much about the protocol for that, but talk a little bit about what happens when you do that. So the basic technology here is, is in that application, you're going to have your uh, redundancy on the, uh, on the ring. And what you'll find is, is that um, you're going to have network uh, traffic flowing uh, through, this, um, uh, through this path uh, here, for, for example. And if that network connection point is broken, we have a link over here that was in a blocking state that was basically interrupted. And by sensing that happen, we uh, bring up this uh, backup link and now can have this communications going to that device. So you can see a lot of heavy lifting goes on in the switches, and there are protocols of which to do that. Um, the most common technique for that, and we'll kind of look at a couple of these, um, has been the spanning tree protocol, which was rapidly replaced by rapid spanning tree. And um, the thing that w that brought about is being a little better for industrial applications to more quickly um, detect that condition and restore service you know, in a couple of seconds. Now, when you're talking machine automation applications, you know seconds are like eternities. So um, one of the things that's been introduced is some vendor-specific uh, technologies. And actually, ODBA has brought about a um, uh, Ethernet ring technology as well. And some of these are still vendor-specific. Um, to do this, whereby you're able to uh, detect that that has happened and restore service, you know, in milliseconds. So uh, just think about this, you know, in choosing the technology you want. Um, so we're introducing here that, you know, think of other technologies other than just doing a star. Uh, think about the rings, and then think about what you want to deploy. You know, if you're doing a process control application, you need to tie in with IT standards. Hey, maybe rapid spanning tree might be okay if you can afford you know, the, um, um, the network to take some time to restore service. But if we're talking about milliseconds, you know, look at that device level ring, look at some of the vendor specific application technologies to get you there to have, you know, these self-healing rings in just a matter of milliseconds for those. Now, um, understand too that, you know, it, it's not an all or nothing proposal here. And one of the things I wanted to point out is, is that you can mix and match these technologies when you choose the right providers. So if you take a look at an example like this, which is um, kind of an abstract application that's part of a gas pipeline project, and you can see you can take and mix and match these where you can have uh, the technology fit to the physical placement of the assets you're trying to control. So you can do kind of a, a mix of, of uh, different types of things. This is a rather complex one. I wouldn't ask some of you that are new to this to kind of just jump, uh, jump, on, you know, jump in and do this on your own. This is really where you want to talk to other people that maybe have experience with your organization or talk to your vendors for help with this or maybe even kind of take on some uh, additional education yourself to do this or talk to some application engineers to get help educate you on how to do some more advanced applications. But um, you know, utilizing um, the uh, the current generation managed switches can do some really interesting topology. It's like this, where even little small failures and even double uh, faults um, can keep your system up and running. Um, again, the part is is to segment your network into common repeatable building blocks, and utilize those building blocks in different manners to build up uh, highly resilient networks. 
Now, I can't, you know, when you look at these long distances, I wanted just to kind of drop in another part of this um, in the time, in the short time we have today about these best practices and talk about, you know, some limitations on Ethernet. And I want to just remind you guys is that, you know, and some of you probably already know this, that, you know, with Ethernet, that oftentimes, you know, you can't go as far as you'd like to, and there's a lot of interesting technologies out there. And there's also some caveats in that sometimes you have plant environments that have a lot of EMI, um, uh, electromagnetic interference that could be, you know, large uh, uh, pumps and compressors that are on contactors making a lot of EMFI, EMFI, uh, EMI noise and so forth that uh, could be problems for you. You could have RF. Um, I've worked in applications where you've got RF ceiling equipment that's really difficult for communications nearby. And um, let you know there's other things to do beyond the local connection of Ethernet. Or maybe you're an OEM and you kind of deal within the just the cabinet level and don't see what happens so much when those panels get installed. And let you know that you know there are some great solutions out there to go beyond that. So forget, don't forget that Ethernet uh, has different ways to be deployed beyond just that Cat5 connection you know, uh, from the switch to your device in the control panel. And remember that there's optical fiber solutions out there as well. So another practice of doing good Ethernet IP networks on the infrastructure side is, you know, making sure that you have the right type of, of physical connection to that and not to forget that you can easily extend and transparently extend those over um, um, fiber connections. And that can be as simple as this. And this is just the basic concept for you folks that haven't used um, um, fiber for that. And in fact, some of you might have joined us in a past webinar where we talked about um, extension technologies. This is just one of the easiest ones. There are even some technologies that are pretty in recent in the past several years, such as using DSL technology um, to extend Ethernet connections over twisted pair. The concept's still the same in that we take that local uh, connection over here on uh, Cat5, come into an Ethernet media converter that converts that media to fiber. And we do need to have two separate fibers, one for transmit and receive to go to another end to do this. Um, and the concept is, is you can get over that, you know, roughly 300 foot distance we have with physical copper connections on Ethernet. And in this case, over inexpensive, and we're talking, you know, media converters here, you know, under $200 uh, to do this. And you're able to go, you know, with the infrastructure here about a mile um, on, you know, inexpensive multi-mode fiber with that. Um, now, understand there's lots of ways to do this and deploy this. We even have, some of you may know that managed switches sometimes have fiber ports that you can expand those. Um, just remember that, you know, in the applications where you have EMI concerns, where you have to go longer than a couple hundred feet, you know, don't forget about, you know, having switches um, available to um, uh, add fiber or utilizing that block um, building approach, building block approach to use media converters for this. Now, one last thing um, that I think some of you um, had uh, a little bit of knowledge in and some of you didn't is uh, thinking a little bit more about, okay, great, I designed the system and, and install it, and now we can forget about it. Um, you know, thinking about uh, how do you maintain the infrastructure once it's there. And um, I want to spend just a few minutes on this, our last few minutes here, and we've got two subjects to finish up so we can keep us on schedule. Um, about this. And uh, let's just do a real quick poll here, and, and Martin, if you bring this one up and we'll do this one real brief. Um, you know, how important is network performance and availability to you um, and in monitoring that? And, uh, you know, I, I know you might have all of different disciplines, like maybe that's the IT department's uh, job, or maybe you only build a panel that gets installed by somebody else, but give us a little little perspective on it. And uh, uh, we'll kind of let this go for just a moment here and, and get some feedback from you folks. And I know this is kind of a broad one, and you know, of course, the network's important. Uh, Martin, we've about finished with the results here. Let's go ahead and show that one. So great, and uh, this is great. I think we've got a group that, that gets this. I think the part that may be a little bit uh, new is, is making sure we know how to get at that. Um, and um, let's go ahead and do this and um, kind of come back to the, uh, to the slides here. Okay, and let's look at that a little bit. And I think there's a couple things that we hear time and time again from from customers, not forgetting there's some really easy things that are built into Manage Switch that are really helpful. And I'm going to kind of tackle the two big ones. And again, this is a, again one of those subjects we could probably do a whole hour of discussion on, of and looking at some of those things. Um, oftentimes, and this is typically in the development aspect of it, 
and typically in the field service aspect. Uh, and we see this through our technical support team here at Moxa. Um, sometimes we'll ask a customer, okay, um, I need you to do a, a packet capture. <laughs> and they go, what? What is that? How do we do that? Especially if you're an end user. And this is one of the really cool things that switches can do. Remember that switches by nature you know, want to limit traffic between two devices. Um, and it's not easy to see what's happening. You know, gone are the days of when we had Ethernet hubs when you could jack into any port, see everything that's coming in and out of switch. Now it takes um, an extra effort to do that. Um, a great tool is having port mirroring within your switch. So you go in there and you'll select, I want to do port mirroring, and I want to be able to see on port number three everything that happens between port one and two. And this is a valuable tool to use um, off the, you know, commercial um, and actually open source and free tools like something called Wireshark, which is what we're picturing down here, which allows you to go in um, to listen what's happening between the PLC and drive, see this on your screen, store it to disk, and what this allows you to do is, is um, you do this or it helps somebody else within your organization or team to capture that, and through utilizing the switch, store that on the laptop, and then take that and be able to send that to somebody to help you, whether it's one of your developers or somebody else. Really useful tool when you need it, and I think a lot of people underutilize you know, port mirroring within the switch. Okay, let's move on. I think the one that's even more interesting, that's even a little less understood, is understanding that um, there's a lot of great information in switches that are relevant to uh, ensuring the performance and availability of your networks um, with Ethernet IP. Um, and it's not difficult to do um, things such as, you know, um, did I have a power failure on the redundant inputs to my switch? You know, is there something that happened? Um, uh, it was one of the maintenance guys in a panel and maybe uh, disconnected something and uh, maybe there's something wrong with the connection to the device or maybe there's a fuse on my PLC and the PLC is no longer talking. There's some really important diagnostics information that's available from the switch that's underutilized. Um, and all of this is in there uh, as long as you know how to unlock it. And the keys to unlocking it um, are not as easy as some people think about. Um, and traditionally in the past, it's been the realm of the IT department to do this type of thing. And it's been the IT department has utilized you know, SNMP technology, Simple Network Management Protocol, which has been in, in switches since we uh, had switches uh, that were managed um, um, you know, from, from 20, 30 years back. Um, very important technology here, but maybe a little understood. So the past approach has been, okay, to get it out of the switch, we got to use something that's, you know, can talk SNMP and then maybe make that available to my automation systems to something more fundamental like maybe through OPC techniques. And I think a lot of people um, don't know there's an easier way to do that and that there's a lot of technologies now that have taken this and made it simpler to say, hey, that same information, we can flatten that architecture and let you see that directly from the switch. So one of the things we uh, like to do is in our outreach is to let you know that um, you can now you know, talk to your switch directly and bring that directly into even a local you know, uh, HMI operator interface terminal in the panel to let you know what's happening and do that utilizing built-in Ethernet IP support. So now we're utilizing that explicit messaging and able to bring up uh, information that could be as simple as you know, letting an operator not see all the nitty-gritty details inside that a programmer might need to do, but something as simple as, hey, here's a simple fault, and maybe here's what you need to do to um, resolve that, or here's how you need to resolve that. Or if it doesn't go to the panel level itself, at least it could go up to um, somebody in the control room that can have that visibility. So in a matter of seconds, you can know what happened rather than having to you know, manually dispatch somebody to go look at what's happening in the control panel. And we're seeing a lot of uh, folks, particularly at the OEM level, uh, in remote services being able to use this as a remote service uh, to help their customers on assets are deployed you know, um, in all parts of, of, of different locations. Now, if you do it, um, one of the things that's pretty helpful is, um, and this is a little bit more towards the Ethernet IP speak again, so bear with me here. We've talked about some specific things. Um, this is part of a couple technologies utilizing um, predefined tags called add-on instructions or things that might be associated to an AOI file. And also another technology called a faceplate. And this is nice, and this is something that, that, that many vendors do, including Moxa, to give you kind of predefined canned uh, faceplates. 
and you can see an example here. And I thought this was one was great because this shows a switch. And if you look over here on the left hand side, you can see a couple snapshots of what these faceplates look like. So we predefined some common useful things. We've given you a kind of a graphical representation for this. So you can see over here on this faceplate that can be integrated into a factory talk type of application that showed a lot of shows these two ports have devices connected. So if your application means that you should also have something connected in the upper right hand port that you've got a problem because it's not green. Um, so this is a real simple uh, way to kind of drill down and get useful information out of the switch. And there are dozens of other things here that you can drill down into and integrate within your application um, that's there just by taking advantage of. So again, this is an example of the explicit messaging. This could also be part of your PLC program to see these things. Um, this is only showing an example through the HMI and uh, really important to, um, um, to making smarter applications, helping you reduce the mean time to, to uh, resolve issues that can be outside of the automation system, you know, with cables and power and a variety of other things um, from a systems integration level. And really integrate once you kind of get the basic concept and have some of the methodology down. And then um, with that, I want to kind of finish up with one, one last subject and just real briefly here and then we'll open it up. I think we've got, uh, Martin's been collecting some good questions and hopefully we'll be able to get to everything. Um, uh, that's the, the, the part I like most. Um, what if finish up on, gosh, what if you can't get everything onto Ethernet IP? And uh, again, um, it's been the, the um, most embraced standard here you know, throughout the U.S. and the Americas. But not everything's on Ethernet IP yet. What do we do about those, those struggling ones? How do we do that? And I just want to introduce real simply the concept of gateways. Um, you know, there's a lot of ways to approach this. And I think one of the, com the conventional approaches has been, oh, well, I know that I can go to these guys and buy a specialty module, but um, that's kind of difficult because they all program a little differently. You've got to write programs to support those plug-in modules that maybe talk another protocol. Uh, you have to have space in your rack to do that. Um, there's some development time to do that. I want to make sure you knew that there were some other solutions out here that are a plug-and-play solution um, utilizing this technique called a gateway. And the gateway allows you to drop this on your network. And this is a real abstract application here, just to kind of do something real simple, that show, shows this gateway coexisting on your Ethernet IP network. So it's not going to be the only device. It's going to drop on here with a switch and you know more other things attached. And this acting as remote I.O. And then being able to utilize this to maybe talk to an intelligent device. And here's one of the things we see most often not easy to integrate are the specialty devices like a three-phase power meter. This one and these types of devices typically talk Modbus serial. And wouldn't it be nice if you could flatten your network and make it easier to, to uh, bring this into your control solution? So the basic concept is, is, hey, there's gateways out here that can connect network to network, network to serial, and basically do on-the-fly protocol translation kind of like being able to use Google Translate to translate technical details. So if, you're, if you uh, kind of can uh, embrace that technology, just real quickly, here's how it works. Um, with those three parts, you know, this gateway needs to be set up. There's a little bit of configuration, but really no programming. And uh, it's able to go out and pull data. So tell me what the volts, tell me what the amps, tell me what the watts are in this meter. Send the request and get that answer back and uh, refresh an internal data table inside of this gateway. Um, now this could be one simple object, it could be uh, a list of objects you want to pull, pull and that comes into um, a memory inside of this. And uh, depending upon your application, it may be read-only, um, in which case this would be an input table relative to the PLC, or it could be write-only, uh, or some, some combination of. And then with that, um, that information is uh, accessible to the PLC application is remote I.O. And then to you have your I.O. request to read data and then the reply comes back like that. So that's a real high level. Um, you know, there, there's, there's more to this, but I think those are the, the gist of how these types of devices work. A um, number of vendors out here have some really great solutions for this. I just wanted to kind of expose this to you and kind of share with you that when you can't get all everything connected, 
there's some great solutions that will save you some time and money um, in bridging Ethernet IP to other protocols such as Modbus and other industrial protocols that are out there uh, called these industrial Ethernet gateways. And um, I think we'll leave this one in the slides here for you to kind of go into, but there are actually some well thought out solutions that actually have some supporting software. Uh, it's a real simple process to integrate these and map these in as I.O. And again, ODVA is a great resource to be able to go see this. Um, you can even find some of the supporting materials when you talk about I.O., such as things like a, a EDS file, which in Ethernet IP speak is the electronic data sheet that helps you to simplify the setup of integrating a device on your network. These are all available um, you know, from the vendor website, but you can also find these at ODVA as well. So with that, let's get to wrapping this up. And I know we covered a lot of great topics today. And you know, this um, um, again, we can't do enough with this subject because there's just so much to it. But I hope that for those of you that joined us today, you picked up some new ideas and tips and techniques. Whether you know you're a new beginner to this or you actually um, have a little bit of experience, I hope you kind of had a takeaway uh, of maybe some new value you can bring to your organization to uh, to do this. Um, you know, whether it's on the network infrastructure piece or whether looking to do this, you know, we talked about, you know, some ref refreshers of fundamentals of how IGMP snooping is real and fundamental to uh, managing uh, remote I.O. on Ethernet IP, to how to, you know, not forget about doing that network infrastructure and the redundancy piece to make sure if there's a single point of failure, how you recover from that. Or use the conventional approach that might take a few seconds utilizing rapid spanning tree or maybe a faster ring approach to that. You know, how to extend your Ethernet connection uh, uh, for those applications. And lastly, you know, maybe these, these ideas of how do I get those non-Ethernet IP devices on there. But most importantly is, you know, where do you go to more information? You know, if there's something specific, you know, we can help you with here from Moxa, you know, feel free to reach out to us to contact your local distributor, one of our uh, field application engineers. Or, or folks, um, but we really like and, and we've participated in this organization called the ODVA. There's a lot of great things there, and I think I showed a little bit of one of the pages where you can drill down to look at the supplier directories, how to find uh, parts that are that are uh, compliant with the ODVA standards, how to find more information, and a couple of those planning and infrastructure guides are great. They're kind of long, so if you're new and you kind of download one and look at it, don't let that scare you off. There's a lot of great stuff there, and I found that um, you know it's worth spending a little time to to read a little bit about that. And lastly, I think a lot of our our the folks joining us today are, are more of a controls engineering background or automation engineers. You know, um, I spent uh, a bit of time working in the data center realm, and I learned a tremendous amount by really understanding what it's like to look at things from a top-down perspective from IT and learned a lot about some really interesting technologies that helped me. So I'd encourage you, um, uh, if you have people in your organization that are more of an IT background, to use this as an opportunity to reach out to them and, and uh, learn more about the IT. Um, or if you take maybe an extension course, learning more about you know maybe getting um, certified on networking standards, it's well worth your investment. With that, I'm going to ask Martin to join us. And Martin, perhaps we can open up to some questions here. and. I think I might have been a little long-winded today, so hopefully we can, we're can. we okay with everybody's schedules to go a few minutes, and um, I'll open up for some questions. All right. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, yeah, we're going to try to get to you know, a few questions here. The first one I have, Paul, is, is from uh, Will. Uh, he asks, what's needed to set up a switch for Ethernet IP? So uh, how about it? No, good, good question. And, and um, I think it can be a little intimidating when you first get into a managed switch with all the options. And the good thing is, is I think most of the vendors that I've worked with, basically, you can just install it and use it as a smart switch um, just to see what's happening. And the real most important thing is, and um, uh, at least from a Moxa perspective that I can speak knowledgeably about, really all you have to do is go in and, and turn on IGMP snooping. So you click the little box for that and set it, and that's really the key thing to do. Um, with that, um, I, and I know from our our work, we had some great customers come back and say, you know, I like to build panels, and it's extra work to go do that. Is there a way I can get that pre-configured? And um, we, like many manufacturers, also will offer a couple models that are pre-configured with that. So if that's something of interest and you didn't know about that, um, please reach out to one of our our uh, people or one of our distributors. You can get a number of our uh, managed switches. 
already set up for Ethernet IP uh, by adding a suffix to the part of it that you can just install it and forget about it. Um, you do have to make sure you have the IP address set right, uh, but uh, Ethernet IP is set by default uh, on that. Uh, good question. Thanks, Martin. All right, the next question I have is from Charles, and it, I'll, I'll, Charles has two questions here, and I'll make sure I get to both. Um, so working with, he's working with another vendor that has a hop limit of seven switches uh, from the main control switches. So convergence has become excessive. Have you seen uh, this type of convergence elsewhere? And then also his, his second question is layer two versus layer three. Um, do you have a preference there or any insight as to, you know, the differences? Uh, you might want to spend a little time on. I know that it could open a can of worms with, with, <laughs> with that topic, but, you know, maybe just quickly um, answer his questions. Absolutely. Let's see if we can kind of, kind of do that. Um, let's see. I guess on the, uh, on, on the limit for, um, um, you know, how many switches you can, you can, in a, a cascade. I think you're talking about hopping as you know having a uh, switch feed to another, and you know those those latencies are very minor, and they may be uh, a little artificial, limiting it to seven. Um, you know we've seen applications where we've uh, seen you know um, uh, 20, 30, 50 switches in a ring, um, but. Uh, again, uh, thinking that you probably want to have uh, a layered approach to that. What it all comes down to basically is what that switching latency is. Um, each switch is a little bit less and you'll probably have to kind of have maybe a little more targeted uh, discussion with your specific vendor on what your real-time system requirements are and, and what that latency is, which is typically in the realm of, you know, um, microseconds. So if you had, say, 10 microseconds per switch and seven switches cascaded, you're 70 microseconds. If you're in the realm of, you know, 100 millisecond scan cycles, probably probably not an issue for you. But again, maybe a little application specific on that one, and, and uh, may hopefully I can help you out on that one, Charles. On the second question about layer two versus layer three, um, those are kind of referring back to the ISO layers. I think we had one slide from ODVA that kind of talked about that. And I think the best way, um, you know, with the limited amount of time we have today about this is, is really when you talk about the differences, um, the layer three is when we're trying to do routing on a network. That is actively directing traffic from one place to another. Um, so um, this would be in the realm of doing routing. So typically not something you're going to see at a control panel level. Um, it's typically something you're going to see at the higher levels in, in, in a factory network of how you want to direct that traffic um, to other parts of an organization. So um, uh, I think the best way I can address that one is if you need to direct traffic based upon certain policies, that that's generally when you start to find the layer three switch become important uh, to you. And uh, kind of an advanced topic. Um, and I hope that addresses for you. If not, let us know. We can get you in contact with someone to have a more thorough discussion on that uh, to help you out on that one. Uh, Martin, our next question. Yeah, I think we have time for one more. Um, this last question will come uh, from Kathleen. She's curious about uh, running mirroring. She wants to know if you can constantly run mirroring as a remote service. Uh, so maybe shed some light there. Oh, good question. Um, and. And and uh, let's let's go do a little quick refresher. So the the mirroring is is how we can get inside the switch, which switches by nature, even managed switches out of the box installed by default, will want to segment traffic amongst the devices uh, that are communica actively communicating. So again, if you put a switch in uh, managed or unmanaged, and you tied into port number three, and you wanted to see traffic between ports. Um, you know, one and four, uh, you would not see it. Um, so that's where you enable the port mirroring. And yes, you can um, turn it on and leave that on at all times. Um, you know, there's not a problem with that, um, provided that a, a, a couple of things happen here. Um, number one, that it's not a problem for the device that's uh, receiving um, the port mirroring, okay? Um, a common application might be maybe an industrial PC that is installed in this application. So um, if the industrial PC is in that 
port that's receiving the port mirroring and it's able to receive the traffic, no, no, no problem. Um, as long as you, you know, are okay with that additional traffic coming in on that port and with the operating system being able to handle that. Um, generally, I think um, uh, it might, you know, there are some other restrictions you can do to segment the traffic if you want to throttle it and do other things, but I don't see any problems with that. And then in terms of remote service, um, we might need a little more definition on that beyond the scope of just the webinar discussion here. But I see that remote service being an application software doing something useful with that port mirroring on that attached embedded PC. Um, um, might need some more uh, you know, discussion on what you'd like to do with that. Great. So yes, thanks, Paul. Um, we are at the end of our session. We've had, we have a few more questions that we have time for. Um, but I just want everyone to know that we'll get those questions answered. Uh, so again, thank you to Paul. Thank you to everyone for your interest and participation. Also, everyone will be receiving a follow-up email with both the recording, presentation slide deck, and the Q&A. Lastly, please take a minute before logging off to fill out our survey, as we really value your input and feedback. Uh, thanks again for tuning in, and have a great rest of the week. Bye now.